Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is over Zechariah chapter 11, entitled, Sheep to be Slaughtered. You got a Bible with you? We're in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 11. Working our way through the Old Testament and working a little harder in Zechariah just because it's a tough book. It really is. Zechariah is a book full of prophecy, and for the most part, almost 100% even today, uh, a large, large portion of it, I should say, of Zechariah is still unfulfilled. It's still yet to be. It's uh, because it revolves around the second coming of Christ and the millennial reign of Christ and these predictions and things. And uh, the, the central theme all the way through the book is God's blessing of his people, namely Israel, the Jews, and in particular, uh, that they would be a blessing. Listen to the type of statements that he makes concerning the Jews. You think about the Jews, where they stand today and where they're going to stand someday. Look at what it says, Zechariah 8.23. Now, do you believe the Bible? Well, then pay attention to this. In those days, ten men from the nations with men, of the other tongues shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, one Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. There's not that many Jews out there, guys, so get, your, get you one while you can. I mean, like 16 million Jews and 7 billion Gentiles, so there's not many to go around, and you think, well, how would that possibly be? I don't know how it's going to be. I just know that, that it's going to be because it's in the Scriptures. It's going to come true. And uh, we have an example of that. We're going to be considering that this morning. Other, just other things of how he's going to bless their city. He's going to bless their nation. Uh, how their nation, again, is going to become the center of the world. And how Jesus, the Jewish king, have you forgotten that? The Jewish king is not a Gentile king. He's king over Gentiles, but he's actually himself Jewish. Jesus, the, Gen the Jewish king, is going to rule all over the world from the Jewish capital in Jerusalem. I mean, watch, Zechariah again tells us that on that day, living water will flow out of Jerusalem, half of it to the east of the Dead Sea and half to the west of the Mediterranean Sea and in summer and in winter, and the Lord will be king over the whole earth. No more political parties, no more voting, no more you think you have an opinion. It won't matter. You're going to have a king. We, we're not a democracy. It will not be a democracy, I should say. It will be a monarchy. In that day, it says, there will be one Lord, and his name, the only one. People want to know if I'm a Democrat or Republican. I'm neither. I'm a monarchist. I believe in the coming king. I believe in him. And I'm looking forward to that day, uh, to be sure. So you have these prophecies in, in Zechariah, and most of these prophecies, these predictions, are yet to be fulfilled. And I've heard myself say, and I've heard others say, they're yet to come true, and that's really actually not accurate. That's really a, even though I know what I mean when I say it, it actually is, it's a little, it's bad English. To say that the Bible is going to come true anywhere is actually inaccurate. The Bible already is true. It already is. Jesus tells us that. Look, uh, they, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Not going to be. It is. It's the only thing that is. Now, even though things haven't been fulfilled yet, does not mean they're not true. In fact, a lot of these things in Zechariah, God speaks about them in the past tense as if they've already happened. So they're that certain. So, so get, that through your, get that through your head, please. John, uh, it, uh, Jesus equivocates the, the scriptures with God's word. He says, and he calls them gods to whom the word of God came and the scriptures cannot be broken. Yeah, that's the word of God is the scriptures. They will be fulfilled. They will come true. They, I, there, I said it right there. They already are true. It's hard to get around that. But they already are. And maybe I'm just pounding it in my head, and y'all have already got it straight. I don't know. For the most part, though, Zechariah predicts uh, the events of, that, are, that are even yet still future uh, for us even to today, with one exception. Most, most of the chapters in Zechariah are still not, not yet fulfilled. But with one exception, which is chapter 11, and this has already been fulfilled. When Zechariah writes this or receives these prophecies, everything in the book, everything that's the prophecies was still future for him and for Israel who he predicted it for. But where we sit today, the majority of the book is still yet future, but there's one chapter that has already happened past tense for us. Back in history, back in the time of Christ, chapter 11 came true, and it sort of sits as a template for us. It's an example we look at the scriptures of Zechariah and we say, wow, how could that be true for the Jews? How could that be true that Jerusalem becomes the center of the world? How could that be, you know, all these things? How could it be, does God really mean what he says? Well, you have an example set for you in the scriptures, uh, in Zechariah. Chapter 11 tells us exactly how literal it is, that God literally says what he means, 
and means what he says. And so we're going to consider this chapter together, and we're going to use it as a test case to show when God says this, what does he actually mean? Well, he means it exactly the way it reads, so we need to pay careful attention to it. Jesus promised that the Jews would, because of their rejection of him, that the Jews would be destroyed. Not permanently, not completely, but that they and their city and their country would be basically wiped out for a long time. And in fact, that's happened for 2,000 years up until 1948. The Jews were ran out of their country. Uh, they were not allowed in many, for many years, many centuries, were not even allowed to live there. And only recently have they reestablished a government, as you know, 19, 1948 with them. But Jesus uh, predicts this in Luke chapter 19, verses 42 through 44. If you had known this day, this is Jesus right before he's, the week he's crucified, even you, the things which make for peace, speaking to Israel, speaking to the Jews. But now they have been hidden from your eyes. Notice now is four days before his crucifixion. So they've already rejected him. So crucifixion is just a, uh, a matter of uh, flow, if you will. They've already rejected him. For, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you. Suppose he means that? Yeah, history says he did. In fact, exactly like that. Look at it carefully. They will level you to the ground, your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another. It happened exactly like that. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation, Jesus predicted that they would be, because they rejected him as their shepherd, because they rejected him as their king, that they would pay for that. Luke 13, 35, Jesus says the same thing. For behold, your house is left to you desolate, speaking to the Jews. And I say to you, you will not see me again until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are going to do that. They are going to do that. But these predictions that Jesus makes actually are nothing new because Zechariah makes the same predictions here in chapter 11, 500 years before Jesus. So Jesus is just reiterating a prophecy that was going to come true about 38 years after his death and resurrection. So let's consider what this prophecy has to say here in Zechariah and how accurate it is with regards to how it played out. And we're going to use it as a template to apply the rest of them. We're not going to preach the whole, the whole book today, so don't worry. But we are going to consider this prophecy, and like I said, use it as a test case to help us better interpret the rest of Zechariah. First of all, this, this destruction it speaks of here is going to start from the north and head to the south. Verse 1 through 3, it says, Open your doors, O Lebanon. Read that, the north in Israel. The fire may feed on your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen. So there's, there's this digression from cedars to Cyprus to the next, next verse, oaks. So we're getting small, or we're starting big, and we're going downhill, if you will. The, for wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the impenetrable forest has come down. There is a sound of the shepherd's wail for... Their glory is ruined, and there is a sound of a young lion's roar, for the pride of the Jordan is ruined. And so it's just a descriptive in many ways of, first of all, the, the topography of Israel. The topography of Israel is literally a slope. It starts in the north in Lebanon, uh, where the, the highest peak in Israel is 9,300 feet above sea level. And it slopes downhill, down into the Jordan Valley, below the, the Dead Sea, down to 1,500 feet below sea level. So you've got a grade of more than 10,000 feet in less than 180 miles. gives you about 1%. So if you're, if you're a plumber here, 1% grade is on the money, right? Maybe a little better grade, but at least 1%. So this thing flows downhill. So if, if a flood starts in the north, if it's big enough, you can be sure it's going to wash all the way to the south. If a fire starts in the north, it's going to wash to the south. And it's just, he's just giving this illustration, this uh, downhill prophecy if you will, but it's not a flood of fire, and it's, it's not a flood, by the way, he speaks of the cedars of Lebanon. You ever seen one of those? They're huge. They're massive. Uh, if you read the Old Testament, David and Solomon both harvested these trees, used the wood to build the temple, to build their palaces, to build, build Jerusalem. Here's another picture. There's a person in this picture. I can't find him anymore, but I know there was when I copied this picture off the internet, but they were little. It's a gigantic tree. Cedars of Lebanon are still uh, official trees uh, today. So it starts with the big trees and goes all the way down to the small trees. Of course, it's God's not judgment. He's not mad at trees. He's mad at people. Trees haven't sinned, right? People have. So he said, I'm starting with the big ones among you, and I'm going to the least among you, and it's going to be a clean sweep. 
I'm going to start in the north, and I'm going to head to the south, and it's just going to go the way that I say. And so that's exactly what took place. It wasn't a fire. Uh, it wasn't a flood in the sense of water. But instead, it was an invading army, just like Jesus predicted, that they would surround them, that they would build up siege walls, that they would level them and their children within them, and that they would not leave one stone upon another. In AD 66, the Jews did a really dumb thing. They revolted against the Roman government. Believing that God would come to support them, this tiny band of Jews decided to take on the entire Roman army. Uh, first of all, they had rejected their shepherd, so I'm thinking God's not coming through for that reason. And secondly, you don't just say, God, you have to come help us because we tell you what to do. He doesn't respond well to those kind of things. So they, this tiny Jewish contingent takes on the entire Roman army, and uh, a guy by the name of Vespasian, who turned out to be later on the emperor of Rome, it, Nero was emperor at this time, about halfway through this campaign in Palestine, uh, Nero dies, Vespasian goes to, to Rome and becomes emperor, and his son Titus Vespasian becomes the, the, the general, he eventually becomes emperor as well, he becomes a general that actually takes the whole campaign all the way through Israel. So 66 AD, they invade in the north, from the north, from the direction of Lebanon, from the high ground, just like it predicts here, headed downhill, and uh, they kill a couple hundred thousand Jews in the north part of the Galilee area. They sweep south into Jerusalem, where besieged in the city of Jerusalem is 1.5 million Jews. Now, uh, the Jews were pretty confident in their structure. First of all, Israel, Jerusalem, is uh, a great place to defend if you don't have long-range artillery or stuff like that or bombs or anything. But if you're bows and arrows and rocks like they had back then, swords and spears, then Jerusalem's a great place to be. So they were very confident in their fortifications. They were very confident in their water supply. Jerusalem has an almost unending water supply by the springs that come out from underneath it. And they were very confident in their stores of grain. So they, they believed that they could wait out an army, including a Roman army. So all they would do is sit behind their walls. The Roman government sits outside of them. They could sit there for years, literally, and eat their grain, drink their water, thumb their nose at the Romans over the walls, downhill from them, and they figured that this would take them a very long time. What turned out to be, it only took the Romans four months. You know why? Because there was so much fighting among the Jews. In fact, Josephus, who is the Jewish um, uh, historian that was, he was among the Jews that were fighting the Romans. He was captured in the Galilee area. He was brought down to record all the stuff that the Romans did against the Jews in Jerusalem. He records that there were more Jews killed by other Jews in the siege than by Romans. Because there, I know you've never heard of this before, but there was political factions that hated each other. I know that's that's something you've never heard of before, right? Fighting each other and that were at each other's throats. Well, they were locked in a city that was relatively small, 1.5 million of them. And they literally began killing each other. There was a group among them called the Zealots. These Zealots uh, decided that they, again, the whole idea of forcing God's hand, they decided they were going to make God come through for the Jews. And the way that they were going to do it was they were going to burn up the entire food supply. Super smart. Guess what? God had already planned that he was not coming through. We're going to see that prophecy here in just a minute. And so what would have taken four years, or maybe more, took only four months because they destroyed their entire food supply. At the end of four years, the Jews that had not killed each other, if, when they starved to death, the other people were cannibalizing them. That's how bad it was. So when the Romans came in, when they actually broke through the walls, there was really no one else to kill. Uh, in one day, the Roman, the Roman soldiers threw 100,000 bodies over the walls just to simply get some of the smell out of the city. Can you imagine that? Just an incredible, uh, it was super bad. Let's just simply say that. It was super bad. And so what, what they were told when they invaded the city... They were told by their emperor to not burn. They could burn anything and destroy anything they wanted, pillage anything they wanted, but they were not to burn the temple. Well, inadvertently, a Roman soldier shot a flaming arrow, <clears throat> went through either the door or, the, or a window inside the temple. The temple was, was paneled with wood. 
top to bottom, floors and everything. Over the wood was laid gold. So he shot a flaming arrow, caught the wood on fire. Of course, the wood is burning. What happens to the gold? Well, it all melted, settled all down into the rocks of the Temple Mount. So in order, when they got there to get rid of, to take the gold, guess what they had to do? Exactly what Jesus said. They had to unstack every single rock. You go with us to Israel today, and the ruins of the temple are there, and they uncovered all around the temple. And so if the, I should say the platform of the temple is there. Guess where the temple is? It's in the valley. All the rocks, all the headstones, all the cornerstones. You want to find the ones that were up on the very top. They're at the very bottom because the Romans came down with pry bars and they pried every stone off that temple mount. Exactly like Jesus, and I should say we're going to see in just a second, Zechariah predicted. And so what happens here in Zechariah is Zechariah is prophesying, he's predicting these events that were to be fulfilled some 500 years later. And God tells him to take on a special service. And that special service is that he's to act out the role of a shepherd. Who was the shepherd at the time that, that the Jews rejected him? It was Jesus, right? He's to take on the role of Jesus. He's to, he's to, he's to pantomime this, 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 this incredible feat of God's Son, Jesus, coming as the shepherd for the Jews, and the Jews rejecting him. And so let's read what God tells him to do here in Zechariah chapter 11, beginning in verse 4. Thus says the Lord, pasture the flock doomed to slaughter. Take on the role, take on the, the style. These uh, Old Testament prophets would, would, would put on plays or put on acts to demonstrate something that God would do in order to communicate a message. So he was to take on this role of a, of a, of a, of a shepherd, pastor the flock that's doomed to slaughter. He already knew where they were headed. So God's not surprised by anything. He knew they were going to reject him. And he also knew what he was going to do, that they were going to be slaughtered. Take on the role, doomed for slaughter. You don't kill sheep, by the way. It's interesting, he's talking talk about a shepherd and that the sheep underneath him are going to be killed. That didn't happen. I mean, you didn't kill sheep. Sheep were, were fed, they were cared for, they were bred, they were sheared, they were loved. Shepherds live with their sheep. They loved them. They were like family members. They probably smelled like them, too. Um, they, they live with them day and night. You didn't, sheep were not slaughtered. Full-grown sheep were not. They were never slaughtered. They were, they were worth too much, alive. Much, much more than they would be dead. And so a sheep that were slaughtered were only slaughtered, they're slaughtered for two reasons. Number one, they refused to follow their shepherd. Or number two, their shepherd died. Those sheep you had to slaughter because they wouldn't follow another shepherd. So you're going to have to kill them. Either they, if they wouldn't follow their shepherd, then they're going to die anyway. You might as well kill them. And if their shepherd dies... In this case, both happen. They reject their shepherd, and they kill their shepherd. And so it's the story, of course, of the New Testament, the story of Jesus. So an added dimension here also, by the way, clarified by historian Josephus. So let's keep reading there in verse 5. For those who buy them, slay them, and go unpunished. When, when Vespasian took over uh, Jerusalem, killed 1.1 million Jews, or they had killed each other. 500,000 Jews, or 400,000 roughly, were taken captive uh, they were led away as captives, as not just captives, but also they were kept as slaves. Uh, a group of the Jews who escaped Jerusalem went to a mountain fortress called Masada. Ever heard of Masada? They get up on this mountain, mountain fortress, and it's impregnable. I mean, as much as Jerusalem was impregnable, this is ten times more. It's up on top of a mountain. There's no way to get to them. Uh, every time they went up to that side of the mountain to build a siege ramp to get up to the top of this uh, mountain fortress, well, the Jews were sitting on top of the wall with a rock. If you come up there with a rolling soldier, they just drop a rock on your head. Simple. And they got lots of rocks. And so they were killing Romans right and left, so they said, what are we going to do? They scratched in their head. They decide, I know what we're going to do. Go get me those Jewish slaves. They will build the siege ramp. And so the next time the Jews on top of Masada hear people constructing a siege ramp, they go over looking to drop a rock and look down there and see their cousin, their mom, their friends. So guess what? They're not going to kill them. Smart on part of the Romans, right? Sad for the sake of the Jews, but again, there you have it. Slaves, the Jews became, the ones that lived, became slaves. Let's keep reading here. So it, it says, each of them sell each other basically in verse 5 blessed be the lord the person that sells them says for i have become rich and their own shepherds have no pity on them verse 6 for i will no longer have pity 
on the inhabitants of the land. That's a sad story. Because that's all they had going for them. But behold, I shall cause the men to fall, each one under another's power, and into the power of his king, and they will strike the land, and I shall not deliver them from their power. What is it speaking of? Because people say, well, there's no way, because there was no king in Israel at the time of Jesus. Well, I would say, first of all, I do believe Jesus was the king. In fact, I do believe that when Pilate crucified him, remember what he put above his head? King of the Jews. That's what he's crucified for. In fact, Pilate questioned the whole thing is, in the trial of Jesus in front of him. Remember what it said? Pilate, Pilate went to the Jews and said, hey, uh, they were crying out, crucify him, way with him, right? Crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? See, they did have a king. That was the whole issue. They're rejecting their king. So they picked another king, didn't they? Look, keep reading. The chief priest answered, no, we have no king, right? But Caesar. What does it say here that their real king, the one that they pick, will do? Notice. But behold, I shall cause men to fall and each into another's power and into the power of his king, and they will strike the land. Who did that? Their king did. Caesar did. Caesar marched against them. Caesar, Caesar destroyed them. Caesar destroyed their city. The king that they picked was their demise. Was he not? It's, a, it's, a, it's incredible the precision of the prophecy. It's incredible. And, and again, it serves as a template. It's a test case to tell us. So we read other things in Zechariah and say, well, that can't be literally true. And I would just say to you, based upon what precedent do you say that? Because based upon the precedent of chapter 11, you don't have a leg to stand on. You have to say, I, you know, I don't see how it's going to work, but you know what? God says it. He means what he says because we have this test, test case. We have this precedent. So let's keep reading. A rejected shepherd leads to sh slaughtered sheep. Verse 7. So I pastured the flock, doomed to slaughter. It's amazing to me, Jesus coming into the world, knowing exactly what the Jews would do to him, knowing that they wouldn't reject him, that he still ministered to them. He still healed them. He still preached to them. He still cared for them. He still reached out to them. He still held out his hand to the last day saying, turn, right? That's the way God treats us. God loves us. God loves people. There's a lot of people in this world that I'm scratching my head thinking, I can't believe why God leaves them alive. Well, because he's not like me. He's gracious. He's kind. And, and I'm dependent upon that, by the way. I don't want him to stop being that way. Some people I wish he would change their mind about, but I don't want him to change his mind about me, and so I can't change one and, and, and keep the other. Uh, no, I'm grateful for the graciousness and the kindness of God toward us. And so he pastures the flock, it says, even though it was doomed to slaughter, hence the afflicted of the flock, and I took for myself two staffs, the one of favor and the other of union, and I pastured the flock. So he's playing out this pantomime of, of, of Jesus and of the shepherd who's shepherding sheep who won't follow him. Verse 8. Then I annihilated, this is an interesting thing here, the three shepherds in one month. How, what is that talking about? We'll see. For my soul was impatient with them, and their soul also was weary of me. How could that, simply, how could that apply to the time of Christ in which he was being rejected and being sold and being crucified? Well, it applies to them in the sense of that represents the three branches of the Jewish government at this time, the priests, the elders, and the scribes. Jesus withheld his, uh, I shouldn't say, let loose his most vehement uh, statements against that group of people. Consider what he says here in uh, Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he says. You lock up the kingdom of heaven for people, for you don't go in. They're not going. And, and you don't allow those entering to go. The boys are trying. You won't let them go either. And you devour a widow's houses and you make long prayers just for show. This is why you will receive a harsher punishment, he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel over land and sea and make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are, he says. Yeah, I'm just not really sure how he felt about them. Maybe we need to read somewhere else. Wow. The Son of God says that about you? My soul despised them and they despise me, he effectively says there in, in verse 8. Man. Again, the precision of the prophecy. Verse 9. Then I said, I will not pasture you. What is to die? Let it die. Wow. So God removes his hand from a people. 
God removes his hand from a person. God removes his hand from a government. God removes his hand from uh, any organization. What happens to it? What is to die, let it die. What is to be annihilated, let it be annihilated. And let those who are left eat one another's flesh. Again, like I said, we, prior to AD 70, we would say, oh, that can't be true. Oh, yeah, it was very true. And not one or two cases either. Hundreds of cases of cannibalism. What is die, let it die. What is to be annihilated, let it be annihilated. God removes his hand from a people. You're done. A, a, word, a word of, of uh, warning to America. We've been living in the good graces of God and taking it for granted as if we determine our own destiny, thumbing our nose and poking our finger in the eye of the one who supports us and is holding us up. It's a mistake. It's a huge mistake. God is holding us together, and uh, if you think he's not, you've got another thing coming, to be sure. Verse 10. And I took my staff favor and cut it in pieces, because God's removing his favor from them, and, and break my covenant, which I had made with all the people, so it was broken on that day, and thus the afflicted of the flock who were watching me realized that it was the word of the Lord. You think about it, in the time of Jesus, he did have followers, right? I mean, yeah, the, by and large, the majority and certainly the leadership of the Jews, they rejected him, but he did have followers, not many. Even of the 12, one was not a real one, right? And then on, on the day in which uh, 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 he was uh, ascended into heaven, they were gathered in the upper room. Remember, there was only like 120 people there. So his entire three-year ministry, I mean, what greater preacher is there than Jesus, the Son of God? All the miracles that he performed, all the people healed, and then when push comes to shove, it boils down to only 120 people. Why? Because that was how complete the rejection was of him. But of that 120, do you think they were all, they were all up, uh, upper class, right? No, they were the poor, weren't they? The, the ones that wound up following him were the fringes of society, the, the, the fishermen, the, the tax collectors. I mean, Paul says of the the church, the Corinthian church, he says the same thing that characterized the church at that time. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many were wise by human standards, not many influential, not many of noble birth. Why? Because those people were full of themselves. We don't need Jesus. We have a king, right? We got Caesar. We trust him. We don't need a king. We don't need someone telling us what to do. We've already got it figured out. We tell God what to do. Their attitude. Right? How accurate, again, how specific this prophecy is and how detailed it is and such a great template for us to compare these other prophecies that we scratch our heads over here in the book of Zechariah. Not, not any more detailed than what follows here, though, in verses 12 and 13, maybe the most specific part of the whole prophecy. And I said to them, so he's finished with his job, I said to them, if it is good in your sight... Give me my wages. So I'm done, right? So give me my check. I'm going to leave. But if not, never mind. And so they weighed out for me 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Of course, this is, again, very specific prophecy. If Jesus was betrayed to, to, the, to the scribes and the Pharisees by Judas for how much? The same amount. It's not coincidental. Anybody here? I know I have a waitress right there. Anybody of the waitresses here? Kim, there you are back there. So, Kim, I won't speak, won't speak to you, so I can speak to Kim because Kim's been my wait, waitress for years. Greg's Kim, by the way, is back there. she go to Yummies or go to um, Sea Ranch or whatever. She's great. So let's say I come in, and Kim is serving us, and, of course, Kim knows us personally. And um, so 15% or 20% is about right for a tip, wouldn't you say, Kim? And since I'm your pastor, it should be like 50%, right? <laughs> a, a tip says for those who work for tips, says, I appreciate what you did. And I got a, what a lesson we got when our girls started uh, being waitresses and, and working in places where they depended upon tips, because we would go to a restaurant and say, Dad, you're not leaving less than 15%. Nothing, 50, you start at 15%, it was like, an $80 bill, 15%, I'm doing the math, I mean, that's just, I mean, $5, everybody gets $5 every, up until then. Everybody got $5. Of course, if, you, if my bill was only $8, I gave you $5, I think that's pretty good. But if my bill was $80, I'd still want to give you $5. But my, my daughters, I've changed. I'm better. But let's say I go into Kim and 15% is, is uh, 10 bucks, but, uh, but I, I don't leave her anything. What does that say? You knucklehead, I forgot. Nobody, nobody here ever forgot to tip your waitress or waiter? No one? Is it just me? 
It happens, doesn't it? It's not nice. I mean, these people are working hard for their, for their money. It's, it's great. Tipping 15% or 20% says, I appreciate you. Uh, forgetting to tip them says, I'm a knucklehead. I should have appreciated you. But what if Tim ser- Kim serves me and I leave her a nickel? What does that say? It says that we need to talk, Kim, apparently, because we got problems, right? No. It, it sends a very clear message, does it not? See, it's not, I didn't forget. That would have been nicer, to leave zero. But to leave five cents sends a very clear message, doesn't it? That's exactly what's happening here in this story. Zechariah's predicted, of course, 100% came true, that Jesus would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. It's not, they say, 30 pieces of silver, that's a whole lot. No, it's the amount, it's the message that it communicates. The, the, the 30 pieces of silver was the exact amount that, that you bought and sold a female slave for. So he's, they're in that price that they're valuing him at, they're saying two things to him. First of all, they're saying he's a slave. You work for us. You do what we say. Uh, we, we tell you what to do. And I know all of you good Christians out here are saying, I can't believe they would say that to the Son of God, right? Well, have you ever done that? God, God's supposed to answer my prayers, right? He's supposed to do what I say, right? He's supposed to jump when I say jump, right? Yeah, I'm thinking you're undervaluing him. I'm thinking you are. He, he's supposed to go in my way. It's supposed to work out the way I thought, Right? I think, uh, I don't, don't ever come to the creator of the universe with that attitude. Let me just recommend that to you. You're undervaluing God, listen, if you think he works for you. Because it's not the way it works. You're undervaluing God if you, if you think he follows your ideas and plans. You're, you're really missing out on the blessing of who God is. See, he's the all-knowing one. He's the all-capable one. So why don't you let him be that? You're going to get a lot more value out of him that way. You really will. You're, you're undervaluing him if you think you... That, that he does what you say. And you're going to find that God is very useless to you if that's your attitude towards him. And, and so not only are they undervaluing Jesus here, they're also, in the sense of calling him a slave, they're also calling him a female slave. And this is not a sexist thing. It's just a very simple, uh, simple matter of physiology. A man, men typically are stronger and bigger than women. So if i got a woman here and a man here, which one is going to be able to carry a heavier load? Most cases, the guy. Not always, I know. Most cases, the guy, right? So I'm going to put more money on him than I will her. She would sell for 30 pieces of silver. He would sell for 60, twice her value, because he could probably do twice her work. Again, it's not a sexist thing. It's just a matter of physiology. So when they're selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, they're saying, number one, you're a slave. Number two, you're a weakling. Wow. Like I said, if I left Kim five cents, would that communicate a message to her? You should call me, Kim, if I do that to you. I got, I got myself a problem. My pastor and I have got to have a meeting, you bet. Not going to do that to you, don't worry. They communicate that to their shepherd, to their savior. This is how much we care about you. This is how little you mean to us. This is how little your service was to us. You mean nothing to us. Of course, this is the exact amount that Jesus has sold for under Judas. And by the way, do you remember what happened? So Judas goes to the priests and the scribes, and, and, and he, he uh, says, So how much will you give me if I betray Jesus? And they handed him 30 pieces of silver, and so he betrays him that night in the Garden of Gethsemane. He comes back the next day after Jesus has been on trial, and he comes back and he's kind of grief-stricken about it because even though he doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah, he doesn't believe he's the Son of God or anything like that, he does believe Jesus is an innocent man, so he tries to turn the 30 pieces of silver just to ease his conscience. He had a hard night's sleep. 30 pieces of silver isn't worth near as much today as it was yesterday because I feel so bad about betraying innocent blood, he says. They wouldn't take it. Why? Because it's blood money, you see. They, they, sold, they, they sold him for 30 pieces of silver for blood. And of course, here's these self-righteous dudes who committed murder, and yet they won't take blood money at the same time. So it's, talk about hypocrisy. So, so these guys are, uh, so what does Judas do, remember? So they wouldn't take his money back. And so he just goes into the temple, and he throws the 30 pieces of silver away. He just throws them into the temple. And what do they do with that 30 pieces of silver? Do you remember? 
They take it, and they buy the potter's field with it. That's exactly how it works out in the New Testament. Now, with that in mind, let's read what it says here that, they, that Zechariah predicted. Look at verse 13. So, so give me my wages, right, in verse 12. What does he give them? 30 pieces of shekels of silver. And then verse 13, then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. Wow. That magnificent price which you valued, which I was valued by them. So they took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house, in the temple of the Lord. So how specific is this prophecy, you see? See, it's such a template. It's God, exactly like God said it would go. I mean, who would have read it and thought it would actually go for 30 pieces of silver? I mean, that's just a figurative thing, right? It's not literal. Well, hello. No, it was. It's a template. So how literal are the other things in the book of Zechariah? For that matter, the rest of the scriptures. God, listen, says what he means. Means what he says. So I want to leave you with a thought. I want to back up to a previous, previous point, but I want you to think about this because I want us to end this way. Could it be that God is undervalued? In your life? That God doesn't hold the position that he actually could have, that you really need him to have in your life because he's undervalued? Here's how you're going to know if he's undervalued. So he's sovereign and all-knowing, right? But you still re not rely on your own knowledge and wisdom. God is undervalued. God is undervalued in your life. He, he's the absolute Lord, but you still treat his commands as if they were suggestions. God is undervalued in your life. Those commands are there to rescue you. They're there to save you. They're to they're deliver you from, from uh, some horrible stuff. He, he's, here's another. He's, he's the shepherd, right? And you're the sheep, and yet you decide where the green pastures are and where the still waters are and where the right places to lay down are and where the right paths are, right? God is undervalued if that's you. God is undervalued in your life. I'm going to ask you, please, to bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we think about these things today. The accuracy of the Scriptures, the power of the statement of God being able to see so far in advance the things that would happen and speak of it very specifically, and the message of a group of people who so missed it. They rejected their shepherd. They refused their king. They wanted him just to be a slave in their lives. They considered him to be basically worthless. A huge mistake. But we do the same thing when we undervalue God in our lives. When he doesn't have, when he's just our helper, when he's just our co-pilot, when he's just our advisor, when he's just our counselor. He, he's not those things. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. He's the Shepherd. He's the one. He's it. He has to be the center, not, 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 not one of the spokes of our life, but the hub of our life. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are those things. God, I ask you to forgive us for the way we have undervalued you, the way, the way your, 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 your work in our lives has been undervalued, the way your, your, your ability to control us and in, in our, our giving ourselves over to you has been undervalued because we're not doing it. We're not, we're not letting you. And you, like a gentleman, are letting us go. You're, letting us, you're, you're accepting our no just like the, you accept our yes. God, we ask you to forgive us for undervaluing you. We pray, God, that you would have the value that you deserve in our lives because you deserve it and also because it's the best thing for us. Thank you, God, for speaking to us today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the accuracy of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.